Today's presenter is Amanda Hartree. Amanda is a licensed marriage and family therapist and has worked in the area of elder care and caregiving for the past eight years. Amanda works as a family consultant for Family Caregiver Alliance and has a private psychotherapy practice in Berkeley specializing in issues related to caregiving, including stress management, life transitions, and grief loss. First, I'm going to be talking about caregiving from a distance managing care for somebody who's maybe 3,000 miles away, but it could also be somewhere even closer. Um, most of the information that I'm giving you today is based off of a handbook for long distance caregivers that my agency put together. You can access it for free at this link here. Um, so let's talk about what what I mean by caregiving from a distance. You might not identify as a caregiver, but you actually may be. You might be calling to check in on mom to see if she took her meds, paying her bills online, visiting and seeing that the house is a mess, there's no fresh food, maybe dad is disheveled and confused. So you actually are a caregiver, whether you know it or not. Um, you don't have to be that far away. So even the distance of an hour can prove to be a real challenge when you're trying to manage their care. You also may be a secondary caregiver. So maybe somebody closer to the person is acting as the primary caregiver and you're the one who's providing support to that person. Some of the common challenges that we found in managing care from a distance are relying on what people are telling you versus seeing the situation for yourself. So maybe you are calling and checking in on mom and seeing if she's taking her meds. And she's telling you everything's fine, and yes, she's taking all of her medications. And then you go and visit, and you see a completely different story. Or maybe the primary caregiver is telling you one thing, and when you get there, you see that something else is going on. Another challenge is trying to find balance between your work, your family, and the caregiving that you're providing. Um, so figuring out when and how often you should visit, that can be a challenge, um, especially when it comes to finances and taking time off from work to travel. If you have to travel you know, to the middle of the country, you can't go every weekend. Um, you can't go every week. Uh, that would be very expensive, and trying to get time off from work all the time, it's just not feasible. Um, a lot of things that I hear from clients are wanting to move their care recipient to them to make it easier. But that in and of itself can be logistically very difficult. So contemplating moving your relative closer to you can be a challenge. Um, finding resources in their area, how do you go about doing that? Um, and also monitoring care workers. So maybe you've hired somebody to provide in-home care for your relative. How do you know that they're getting good care? How do you know that they're safe? So what can you expect as a long distance caregiver? Um, you can expect your caregiving role to include two key functions. So you're an information gatherer, you're using websites, you're calling resources, and also a coordination, coordinator of services. There's a lot of community agencies out there to help you handle these challenges. It's your job to find out the resources and use your knowledge to put the pieces together. So I have a few rules. There's no real rules in managing care from a distance, but I have a few guidelines. Um, and the very first one is to take care of yourself. This rule is the most important, yet most family caregivers often forget it. Um, you, if you're not taking care of yourself, if you experience caregiver burnout, then what? If you're not able to provide care, who's gonna step up and be able to pro provide the care? Um, also to know that your knowledge and confidence will come a little at a time. So sometimes you'll find that you're taking a step sideways, you're taking a step backwards. You might feel like you're pulling out your hair, but you will sort it out and you'll find solutions. Make sure to get the support you need. So that comes in so many different forms. It can be other family members, it can be friends, it can be a support group, it can be professionals but don't expect to go this alone. When possible, and it's not always possible, but when possible, involve the person who needs care in the decision-making process. This is very important. Sometimes you can't do this. If they have moderate to advanced Alzheimer's, that may be a challenge. 
but they might have expressed what their values and preferences were before they moved into a moderate to advanced stage. Respect those values and preferences, even if they differ, differ from yours. So how do you get started? Well, if you're embarking on this right now, if you've been doing it for a while, if this is just the start for you, it's good to pause and just take stock of what ha what's happening right now. What is the situation? So I advise to get a notebook or a three ring binder and create a care notebook so that when there is a crisis, then you have everything easily accessible at your fingertips. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but here is a list of important things to collect before a crisis. I got this list. I thought it was a really good comprehensive list from AARP. Um, just to touch upon a few of them, medical records, um, a list of medications that they take. That's really important. If they end up in the hospital, you want to be able to tell the doctors what medications they're taking. Um, financial, what are th what's their income? Um, a lot of the community resources that you may reach out to will want to know that information. Um, Sharon talked about this, very important to have an advanced health care directive, power of attorney for health and finances. Um, if they're already in place, great, find out where they are. If they're not in place, it's really prudent to get those, get those signed and done. So the next thing you want to do is assess the situation. What do I mean? You need to get clarity. What are the care needs right now? Care needs change. They're constantly shifting. But in this moment, what can your relative do independently? What can they do with a little help? What can't they do at all? The needs will change, so you're going to have to keep revisiting this. And very important to get a medical diagnosis, both physical and cognitive. If your relative is showing some short-term memory loss and you haven't had an assessment, might be a good idea to get one. They can rule out dementia, perhaps. Maybe it's, it's some underlying issue. Maybe it is dementia. It's good to know what you're in for. It's good to know so you can plan for the future. I've put together a checklist of care needs. Again, I'm not going to go through every single one of them. Um, it's a long list, but this is a really good comprehensive list to assess the situation. So does your relative need meals delivered? Do they need help with personal care, such as dressing, bathing, using the toilet? Um, do they need help getting to and from appointments? Uh, do they need help with their medications? Uh, it could be that they are alone all the time. Maybe they need a trip out of the house. Maybe they, need a, they can't get out of the house. Maybe they need a friendly visitor. Maybe they need emotional support. So with that checklist of care needs, there are community services. I can't promise you that they exist in every single area that your relative may be. Um, but just so you have a sense of what is out there, um, meal delivery, adult daycare, in-home aides, geriatric care managers, I'll talk a little bit more about those, transportation, help with Medicare claims, volunteers and friendly visitors, support groups, telephone check-ins, and financial assistance. So where do you start looking for all of these resources? Um, my agency, Family Caregiver Alliance, is one place to start. Um, we, uh, we serve the Bay Area, my agency, although we're part of a network of caregiver resource centers. There's 11 of us through the entire state of California. We serve every county in the state of California. So if your relative is anywhere in California, there's a caregiver resource center that can help you find resources. If they're out of state, Family Caregiver Alliance also houses the National Center on Caregiving, um, and you can call up the number and talk to somebody, and they can help point you to resources in the state that your relative is in. Also, that handbook for long-distance caregivers that I referenced in the beginning, that has some other ideas of how to access resources. Other presenters in this room, OnLock, and whoever else is going to be presenting later, I'm sure they have ideas. 
Um, also, every state has a local area agency on aging, and you can just Google that and find them, get their phone number, and ask about resources. So you have done the assessment, and you've started to identify resources. Um, and next, you want to identify your caregiving team. So the one thing, the first thing you could do is to hire a care manager, also called a geriatric care manager. And this is a professional who assesses your relative's needs and sets up a plan of care. So basically, everything I'm telling you to do, this person will do for you. Of course, most of the time, it's for a fee. Um, some come through nonprofit agencies. Some are private. Um, and it really varies in terms of how much they charge. Um, it also depends on what your relative's income is. Um, so that's one route. Um, if you decide to do this yourself, um, you might want to ask who's in relative contact, regular contact with my relative. So nearby siblings, other family members, close friends, neighbors who know your relative well, uh, people who, who um, your relative sees frequently. So it could be clergy or a housekeeper who comes in often. And also professionals with longstanding relationships. Really important to introduce yourself to your family members, doctor, and any others that are engaged in providing care if you haven't already met them. A lot of people have family that can help in supporting caregiving, but I also know of a lot that don't. I'm going to talk specifically about those who who do, um, but I do understand it can be a challenge if you just feel, if you're an only child, if there's no other family around. Um, that's a whole other topic, and I can talk to you offline about that. Um, Sharon did a really nice job of outlining a family meeting, um, so that's one thing that you would you would want to do. Um, you want to clarify goals and responsibilities. You also want to air feelings and ask for support. So you might be holding a grudge, feeling like, "Hey, I'm doing all the work here, and." You know, my siblings are over here doing nothing. Um, how do you let them know that you want them to do some of the caregiving tasks as well? Um, in that handbook that I referenced, we do have a how-to of how to hold a family meeting, although, again, Sharon also outlined it really nicely. Um, meetings don't have to be in person. They can be over email, private web chat room, telephone call. But what's really important is not to delay. You want to get all the available people in as soon as possible. Um, if some people can't make it, oh well, get as many people as you can. Um, include the relative who needs care as much as you can. Um, and then determine the roles. So what are your strengths and abilities? What are theirs? So maybe you're really great at bill paying online. Maybe your sister's really great at talking to doctors and making that personal connection. Maybe somebody else is really good at researching the resources. So you want to figure out what the strengths and abilities are of everyone and delegate jobs so the burden doesn't fall completely on you. Um, a big question I get asked is, well, how do I pay for this care? One thing to know is Medicare won't pay for most of the services needed. Um, people often think that they've paid into Medicare, and when the time comes, Medicare is going to pay for skilled nursing care. Well, that's true, but only for acute medical care and acute hospital and skilled nursing care. It does not pay for long-term care, either in an assisted living facility or a skilled nursing facility. Medi-Cal, on the other hand, also called Medicaid in the rest of the US, may pay for certain long-term care costs, including nursing homes. Medicaid is administered through the states and provides assistance to individuals and families with low incomes. It varies from state to state, so it's important to determine the regulations in your relative's area. So I'll give you a couple links here. VA benefits, if your relative is a vet, if your relative was married to a vet, there may be some financial assistance there through the, through the VA. Um, some community services offer respite programs and scholarships. My agency is one of those community services that offers some respite. Um, and there are certainly others in the Bay Area. Um, I, I don't know about you know, the rest of the country, but I know respite funds and scholarships are available. 
maybe a reverse mortgage is an option. Um, I do recommend speaking to an elder law attorney, uh, especially if your relative has any type of estate. They can be helpful in um, figuring out how to pay for long-term care. Even if there is an estate, there are ways to um, apply for Medi-Cal. So even though I said low income earlier, there are still possible ways that you can get your relative on Medi-Cal while still owning a home. Um, and then a skilled nursing facility may, may get paid for through Medi-Cal. I can't answer that about other states. So another big challenge is balancing work and elder care. And two programs you may or may not know about that I just want to touch upon are the Family and Medical Leave Act, which is a federal program. It entitles eligible employees um, to take unpaid but job-protected leave to provide care. Uh, in California, we also have what's called paid family leave, and you can take up to six weeks a year uh, and receive partial pay. Um, so that's important because it's not job protected, but you can combine that with the FMLA and get job protection and get partial pay. Um, with family paid leave, uh, the six weeks does not need to be taken consecutively. So say you're providing care to somebody who's in San Francisco and you need to take an afternoon off to bring them to the doctors. You can take your paid family leave and just deduct you know, a half a day um, up until six weeks is used and then you can get it again the following year. So a couple links there to learn more about those programs. Uh, resistance is something that you very well may come across. Um, so offers of help may be misinterpreted as an attempt to take away their independence. So a few things you may try. Uh, a little guilt trip never hurt. Explain that they're accepting help will make you feel better. So um, sometimes, or you, often care for this person that you're providing care for, um, and hopefully they care for you too, and they don't want you to feel burdened. Um, they want you to feel like you don't have to do everything, and so if you tell them that this is gonna make you feel better, sometimes that does the trick. Um, explain that services are meant to maintain independence. So you might try, you know, I'm concerned that the way things are going right now you're going to end up uh, having to leave the house. Uh, it's not safe, but if we could get some meals in place for you, um, if we could have somebody drop by and check in on you from time to time, that's gonna keep you in the house, so why don't we try that? Um, as a last resort, you might have a doctor or somebody with a white coat or some other respected person make the suggestion, let them be the bad guy. Um, and if all else fails, if things are in really dire straits, and I don't have this on the slide here, um, Adult Protective Services is always, um, you can always give them a call if somebody is resistant, 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 not wanting help, um, but the situation is very unsafe, it's not hygienic, those types of things. You can call Adult Protective Services. What you should know about them is they're not gonna come and take somebody out of the home. Um, what they're gonna do is try and set up resources and services for them. Um, very different from child protective services, and I know a lot of people get gun shy when they hear adult protective services, but they're really there to help you and help the person that you're caring for. You have to remember that there are some things that you can't control and some you can. Might help to take a step back, be sure that you're not spending energy trying to fix something that really is not fixable. So in summary, Assess, gather information, try to include the person in decisions when you can, identify your care team, research community services, get support, get support, get support, take care of yourself, take care of yourself, take care of yourself. I can't stress that enough. Um, and know what your limits are. You can't do it all. So the next topic, whether you are managing this care from a distance, whether they live with you, whether they live in a facility. Um, if you're caring for somebody who has some form of dementia, including Alzheimer's, you may run across paranoia. 
Um, and it can be very troubling, very difficult to deal with. And so I just wanna go over with you some ideas of how to cope with it. So first, just a quick definition of what is dementia. It's a condition of many diseases. It's defined as impaired intellectual capacity with loss of memory and ability to reason. There are numerous cognitive, functional, and emotional changes and losses. Remember, it's not a part of the normal aging process. So what I'm talking about today is dementia and psychosis. Psychosis is defined as hallucinations and delusions. And when I'm talking about dementia and psychosis, I'm talking about dementia being the primary diagnosis. So with somebody with schizophrenia who has delusions and hallucinations, that's the primary diagnosis. It's schizophrenia. But we're, what we're talking about is dementia being the primary diagnosis. And the psychosis that comes along with it um, is caused by the cognitive impairment of dementia. So psychosis disconnects a person from reality. It's characterized by hallucinations. They can either be auditory, so they hear some things, or visual, they're seeing things, um, and or delusions, which are false beliefs that they believe to be true. Um, remember, not every person with dementia will develop psychotic symptoms. Paranoia is a result of delusion. So I'm specifically now channeling into, I'm not talking about hallucinations, I'm talking about delusions. And paranoia can result from delusions. Remember, delusions are firmly held beliefs that are not real. So really common examples of delusions with somebody with dementia, someone is stealing their money, that's a big one. Someone is trying to hurt them, that's a big one and a scary one. Their spouse is cheating, I hear that all the time. Their home isn't their home. They're at home, but it's not theirs. Um, these beliefs can turn into very troubling behaviors, including aggressiveness, agitation, and sometimes violence. So what you need to remember is that what they are experiencing is very real to them, even if they're not grounded in reality. They're trying to make sense of this world with declining cognitive function. So what you need to know is that their behavior does have a pur purpose. Uh, the person with dementia is trying to fulfill a need. It might not always be apparent what that need is, but some examples are looking for the familiar. So they might be looking for their mother. They might be looking for a particular place. They wanna go home, they wanna go home, even though they are home. Um, they might be looking for something to do. They could be bored. If they're living on their own, they might just be left to their own devices um, in their brain and they have no structure and so all of these false beliefs are entering into their mind. They might have a need to express fear or anger. So an example of this would be if they're feeling scared when, they, when you leave the room, they might have a false belief that someone is trying to hurt them. So you leave, that's a trigger, and all of a sudden they get scared and they turn it into a story that someone's trying to hurt them. Why else could they be scared? Um, they want to also maintain some personal control. So perhaps they always manage their finances and then all of a sudden you take over for them. Well, they might interpret that as someone else is trying to steal their money or you are trying to steal their money. Um, behavior is often triggered. So I use that example, you leave the room, all of a sudden they're feeling scared um, and they get agitated um, and that could, that could very well be the trigger. Um, some other triggers, TV. They may think what they see on TV is actually happening to them. Misunderstandings with people and that can also include hearing loss. They might actually not be able to hear what you're saying. And also with dementia and declining cognitive functions, they might just not be able to fully understand what you're saying. Um, remembering previous life issues. So maybe their spouse did cheat on them way back when, or maybe they had a boyfriend or girlfriend when they were 16 that cheated on them. And they're bringing that into the present day and they're projecting that out there. Um, hearing loss I mentioned, living alone with no structure, um, and a change in routine. People with dementia need routine. New places, new people can disrupt that routine, and that can often trigger behaviors, such as agitation. 
So when you communicate with a person with dementia and a person who's paranoid, you want to understand what is and isn't possible to change. So we, generally speaking, cannot take away their false beliefs. We can make it less intense. We can make it less agitating. But often, we can't get rid of them, even with the best medications. You also need to understand that your thoughts, attitudes, and actions affect the person with dementia. So if you're coming at them and you're feeling anxious, if you're talking to them in a hurried voice, if you're agitated yourself, they're going to reflect that right back to you. Often people with dementia mirror your, what you're giving to them. Um, you also, as we talked about, recognize that a behavior most often results from a cause, so you need to look for triggers. And personal connection is more important than content. What do I mean by that? Connecting with them, speaking to them calmly, giving them a smile, telling them it's OK, being gentle with them. They might not understand what you're saying to them, but just your body language and your tone of voice can be enough to calm the situation down. So let's talk tactically. How do you respond to somebody who's paranoid, who has false beliefs? First of all, don't take it personally. It's nothing against you. Try to listen to what is troubling them and try to really understand what their reality is. So if they feel like somebody is out to get them, that's going to feel really scary for them. Reassure them. Respond to the feeling behind the accusation. Um, and then reassure them. So you might try saying, wow, that must be really distressing. I'd be really upset about that, too. You're safe now. You're with me. It's OK. Remain calm. Speak in a gentle, calm voice. Again, like I said, they might not understand the words spoken, but they'll pick up on your tone and respond to that. Don't argue. I've heard time and time again when somebody tries to orient them in our reality. And that can just exacerbate and escalate the ag agitation. Um, so you don't, wanna, you don't want to agree and say, yeah, somebody is out to get you. Um, that's not going to work. But again, it's just validating their feelings. That must be really scary for you. I'm so sorry you're feeling that way, as opposed to saying, there's no one out to get you. You're fine. Um, try to determine the triggers and remove them. So interestingly, even pictures of grandchildren up on the wall could be interpreted as strangers in the room. Use distractions. Really important if you're going to use a distraction, you need to connect with the person first. So I'm really sorry you're feeling so scared. I'm here with you now. I want you to feel safe. And then you redirect maybe, could you show me some pictures of your family? Or let's go eat that cake over there. Something that's going to distract them in a pleasant way. Try nonverbal reassurances, a gentle hug or a touch. If they suspect money is missing, allow them to keep small amounts in their pocket or handbag for easy inspection. Minimize TV exposure, so especially graphic or violent content. Um, you might want to limit how much of the news they watch. Maybe if they love the news, 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes in the evening. You want to avoid continuous news channels. Increase their activities in human contact. So often what we see is people who are paranoid, as I mentioned before, are left to their own devices in their mind. They don't have enough to do. If they can occupy their mind with interesting activities, with human contact, that helps to keep them from manifesting these false beliefs. Eliminate stimuli, so loud TV, loud music, lots of people, lots of talking might not be the best idea. Um, you know, family gatherings can be tricky, so you might want to limit the amount of people if you have Thanksgiving or something like that. Um, move to a new room, preferably a quiet one. Simplify the environment. There doesn't need to be a million pictures all over the walls. Simplify tasks and establish a routine. Allow rest between st stimulating events. So if you are going out and you've had a big day and you think about how exhausted you are, and you come home and 
you're just feeling like you can't remember anything or a little confused, think about what that's like for somebody with dementia. So anytime you have an activity, allow for ample rest time in between. Offer simple answers. Apologize. I'm so sorry you're upset. Therapeutic lies, we also call them fiblets. They're lies um, for the benefit of the person with dementia. Uh, they're not malicious lies. The truth can sometimes make things worse. So if somebody's saying, I want to see my mother, I want to see my mother, I want to see my mother, but mom's been dead for 25 years, uh, rather than saying, rather than orienting them and saying, your mom's been dead, your mom's been dead for 25 years, um, you might say, you know, I, I imagine you do want to see your mom. You know, she's busy right now. We'll call her later. Uh, why don't we? And then redirect into some, some other activity. Uh, assess for the presence of pain, constipation, or other physical problems. So there might be some underlying issue, and they might not be able to express that to you verbally, and it's coming out as agitation or anger or even violence. So get a medical consultation. Um, and also review medications. Are they start, had they just started a new medication? That could be causing some new behaviors as well. Uh, if you appear to be the cause of the problem, which often that can be the case, if it's safe, leave the room for a while, give them time to de-escalate, uh, and remove weapons from the house. Um, there can be cases of severe paranoia and delusions. If they're extremely troubling, or if they risk harm to the person with dementia or to you, they need to be addressed with the individual's doctor. If necessary, know that it's okay to call the police. You obviously want to explain to them that the person has dementia. They're not going to arrest them. They'll bring them to the hospital. If the symptoms and delusions are severe enough, medications may be appropriate to manage the paranoia. Our first line of defense is always to try non-medication options. So that whole list of how to respond, um, you want to try those first. Um, but you may need to move to medications. And you also want to weigh the pros and cons of the side effects with the doctor. Is it even worth it to put them on medications? So communicating with someone with dementia means acknowledging and building on their strengths and their preferences being patient, understanding, and creative. It's easy for me to stand up here and tell you all of the things you can do, um, but it's much harder in the moment when somebody is saying something and you have to figure out a way to respond to it and try and go through all of the list, the whole list that I gave you. Um, it's about just being creative, and you may come up with your own ideas of how to work with the person. Um, know that you may try some of these techniques and they work the first time, and then you try again, and they don't work. And it's like, oh, why aren't they working? Um, similarly, they might not work the first time, but they may work the second or third time. So just keep trying and take deep breaths and take joy in the simple things. This is my information. I also have cards in the back if anybody wants them, but this is all of the information you need from me. If you need to contact me, please do if you have questions. And this is a little bit about Family Caregiver Alliance. Um, somebody did ask about family meetings. Um, and we can help with resources um, if you're looking for a family meeting. We can help with all sorts of resources. So please do, do contact us. Um, what's the difference between like regular senility and um, Alzheimer's? Is there a test for Alzheimer's to distinguish? So the question is the, the difference between regular senility and Alzheimer's. Is there a test for Alzheimer's? So senility is an old-fashioned term that we don't even use anymore. Um, dementia is the term we use now. It's an umbrella term. And there's many different types of dementia, Alzheimer's being just one type of dementia. There's vascular dementia, Lewy bodies dementia. Um, there are tests. They're about 95% accurate at this point. The only conclusive test still is an autopsy. Um, but right now, what they do is, <laughs> right, so you don't really want that as your test. Um, so what they do now is they rule out everything else that it could be. Um, they do a big battery of tests, and they're, they're very accurate at diagnosing these days. 